بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ جمعہ مبارک ایوری ون اور پریز بلانگس ٹو اللہ وی پریز ہیم اینڈ وی آسک ہیم فار گائیڈنس اینڈ فار گیونس اینڈ وی سیک پروٹیکشن ان اللہ فرام دا میلس آف آر اون سولس اینڈ فرام دا ایول آف آر ایکشنس ہوم اللہ گائڈس نو ون کین لیڈ ہیم اسٹرے اینڈ ہوم ہی لیڈس اسٹرے ہوم ہی لیوز اسٹرے نو ون کین لیڈ ہیم بیک ٹو دا رائٹ پاتھ I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah by himself, no associate to him, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and messenger. O you who, who have believed, fear Allah as he should be feared, and die not except as Muslims. O you who believe, fear Allah and always say a word directed to the truth, that he may make your conduct whole and sound, and forgive you your sins. He that obeys Allah and his messenger has then attained the highest achievement. So today my khutbah will be about the incident of Miraj in the life of the Blessed Prophet Muhammad and some lessons that we can derive from that incident. We'll start with a verse of the Holy Quran from chapter 2 verse 45 and seek help through patience and prayer and indeed it is difficult except for the humbly submissive to Allah. So a question that often arises in our modern times as people wonder about the relevance of religion in their daily lives is, is the structure that Islam gives us to live our life a blessing or is it a burden? Does it free us or does it constrict us? And if it helps us, how does it actually help make our lives better? I will attempt to answer that question while discussing the incident of Miraj, which is reported to have happened after the Blessed Prophet's return from Taif. It is mentioned in the Quran as follows. Glory be to the one who took the worshiper on a journey by night from the sacred place of prostration to the faraway place of prostration to an area that we've specially blessed so we could show him some of our signs. So in brief summary, this incident happened while the blessed prophet was sleeping and he reported that he was greeted by angel Gabriel and he mounted a winged beast named Burak and was carried to Jerusalem where he led several biblical prophets in prayer. And after that, he ascended to the seven heavens, eventually passed through the seventh heaven and met his creator, Allah. It was during this meeting that the blessed prophet was commanded to perform the regular daily prayers. So some people understand this to be a miraculous physical journey of the blessed prophet, while others think that it was a mystical or a spiritual vision that, we, that he had. And however we understand it, this experience of the Blessed Prophet helped bring him a lot of comfort and strength in a time of great distress in his life. And I believe it was about two weeks ago that the anniversary of Miraj was commemorated. So when I think about the incident of Miraj, I feel like the timeless relevance of this event is in reference to the Blessed Prophet being given the structure of the daily prayers during this experience that he had. And this is referenced to in a hadith of the Blessed Prophet in which he said that the Salat is the miraj of the believer. So in order to illustrate this, I will draw some parallels between the experience of miraj and how our daily Salah, our daily prayer can also be a transformative experience. So one way to think of this is how Surah Fatiha is actually a dialogue from Allah. And so I will paraphrase from a Hadith Qudsi in which we are told to recite Surah Fatiha ourselves after listening to the Imam recite it as well. And the reasoning being given is Allah Almighty says, I have divided prayer between myself and my worshiper into two halves and my worshiper shall have what he asked for. When the servant says, Bismillah rahman rahim Allah responds by saying that my worshiper has mentioned me. And similarly, the hadith goes on to describe that every verse of Surah Fatiha that we recite, Allah Ta'ala responds by saying, by appreciating what we have said and by validating and listening to what we say and responding to it. For example, in the end, when a person says, Allah's response is, this is between me and my worshiper, and they shall have whatever they have asked for. 
And so just like when we learn more about the incident of Miraj, we find out that the Blessed Prophet had an audience with Allah and he had a dialogue with Allah. Similarly, in our own version of the Miraj, which is, which is our five daily prayers, we can have our own dialogue with Allah. And that is one reason why in the Quran, we are told to recite with the teal or to pause between the verses. Because doing this helps to think of the reply of Allah as we are reciting Fatiha. So reciting it slowly helps us to be conscious of Allah's response to what we are saying and helps us to be mindful that this is like a two-way dialogue with Allah. In another way to compare the incident of Miraj or the transformative aspect of it to our daily prayer is that when we say the first takbir, when we raise our hands above our shoulders in a movement that many scholars have likened to that of the throwing off of a garb, it's as if we are saying, Allahu Akbar, God is greater than this world which I throw behind me. God is greater than all worries and distractions which I throw behind me. God is greater than the ego that does not like to obey commands or to prostrate itself. And so I throw it behind me. God is greater than myself. So I leave it behind me. And thus begins our journey or our ascension in which we can get as near as possible to Allah. And then we return back to the world when we finish our prayer. And then we say to those around us, whether we think of them as responding to angels or to the humans who are sitting around us as we pray. Just like every traveler, when they arrive somewhere, they say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the Islamic greeting, peace be upon you and Allah's mercy and blessings. When we think about our daily prayer, we know that the sajda, the sajood, when we put our forehead on the ground, is, the, is when we experience the greatest nearness to Allah. And the Blessed Prophet reminded us of this in a hadith where he said, the nearest a servant of Allah comes to their Lord is when they are prostrating themselves. And that is during the sajood. So we are advised to make a lot of supplications in that state. And th those are some ways that when we focus on the prayer and the different parts of it and the different things we say, it helps us to see this as a transformative event in which we can transcend whatever is happening in our life at that time and find comfort with Allah. And so no doubt it is the comfort and the strength in this prayer, which is why Allah made it obligatory and repeatedly urged it in the Holy Quran. There are about 77, 67 times that the prayer is mentioned and the structure of prayer we are given is such that provisions are made to pray in every circumstance, whether we are shortening the prayer or modifying it as needed, even in a state of active combat in battle, Muslims are told to pray because we need. The strange thing is that while we all know about the importance of Salah and no one would argue against it, but we run against two problems in our life. The first is that it is often quite hard to make the Salah a regular habit in our life and to fit it in our lives so that it blends seamlessly with it. The other is that we have made it a habit, but now it has become so much of a habit that it is automatic and it is being performed without finding much comfort in it or much meaning in it. It's another thing to check off in our to-do list. So we need to find the right focus so that this prayer is meaningful and it's a constant source of nourishment in our lives. I recently read a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a best-selling book right now. It is said to be the definitive guide to breaking bad behaviors and adopting good ones in four steps, showing you how small incremental everyday routines compound into massive positive changes over time. So this reminded me of another hadith of the Blessed Prophet in which he said that the most beloved of deeds to Allah are those that are most consistent, even if they are very small. So James Clear says in Atomic Habits that every action you take is the vote for the type of person you wish to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs, but as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity. In other words, if we think about it, habits are more powerful than goals because habits are within our reach. While setting goals or making resolutions may not be as effective because our goals may be unrealistic and we have not thought about a system to support that goal, to make it happen. Each time we take time to pray, 
to do our salah, we are making a decision to bring more God consciousness in our lives and to cement the role of religion as a solace for us and something we can find comfort in no matter what is happening in our lives. The other question that arises is, do we need to pray so regularly? Would once be enough? Or is five times uh, the right number? So another way to ask the same question is, do humans have a need for regular and repeated comfort breaks in their lives? And a simple study of our own life will prove this to us, that we tend to take breaks in our life. We need them. And often we take them in unhealthy ways, resorting to junk food, mindless entertainment. Some people even resort to drugs and alcohol to take these breaks. Or some people don't take breaks and then they collapse at the end of the day and ill health is the result of that. So there are many secular practices that people are turning to more and more to find that comfort. For example, mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, grounding practices and many others. And all of these have a lot of benefit in them. And I think it's worthwhile to learn how to do at least one or two of them. But when we look at the structure of our Salah, we find that it incorporates the best of all of these practices. And just like Salah, they all help to calm the constant chatter in our mind so that we have a baseline of calm. And the more that we engage in other practices that calm us and ground us, the less distracted we will feel while we are praying. Since our life seems to just become more and more fast paced than before, so simply taking time to slow down five times a day is extremely beneficial. And it is much easier to take that break when we know that this has been prescribed for us by Allah and that we are being hugely rewarded for this effort, for simply making the effort. Thinking about how we wash up or perform wudu before we pray, this act of washing up brings our awareness back to our body from our mind. And a lot is being said about this, how we sometimes are so caught up in our minds and the anxieties and frustrations of everyday life that we neglect the needs of the body. So when we start out our salah by washing ourselves, it centers us, it brings us back, it cleanses us and sets the stage for that act of worship that we are about to embark upon. Also, when I think about the importance of emotional needs that are talked more about in recent times, for example, feeling loved, worthy, and accepted, we find that Salah addresses all of these needs. Each time we pray, we are reminded of Allah's love for us through the repetition of the attributes of Rahman and Rahim, which help us to feel loved and valued and remind us to also show love to others. We are also reminded of our self-worth from the fact that Allah created us with huge potential and purpose, and we have the choice to make decisions that affect the outcome of our lives. Every time we recite Surah Fatiha, we are reminded of that. Also, during our busy days, we can lose sight of our values. And values are what keeps us grounded in whatever we're doing and make sure that you know we are staying true to who we want to be. So Salah gives us that time in our day to reflect on who we are, why we are here, and what the core values of our life are that we want to live by. So it is important to bear in mind that there is much room for Salah to be personalized. When we study the various du'as that the Blessed Prophet recited in Salah, we find that there was a variety in what he said. And other than Surah Fatiha, he did not always say the same zikr in the same way. And so learning different du'as or simply pouring our heart out to Allah in our own language helps us to feel that our prayer is a dialogue with Allah and it helps it to become a transformative event in our lives. So basically, Salah will be what we make it to be and it can raise us so high. The discipline of it can be a struggle. It can still bring joy and refreshment to us if we do not expect an instant result and if we are patient with the process. When we understand that Salah is something to be developed step by step, just like everything in life is developed slowly. Even if we are distracted and unfocused while we are praying, it has value. It brings us closer to the point when we will not be unfocused. But if we give up the habit and the daily practice, we will never achieve the sweetness of Salah. This reminds me of another quote from the book Atomic Habits. When you fall in love with the process rather than the product, you don't have to wait to give yourself permission to be happy. You can be satisfied anytime your system is running. 
In short, success is the product of daily habits and not a once in a lifetime transformation. One minute. I say this saying of mine, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. I will conclude my khutbah in the second half. So one way to look at Islam is to see how it is all about establishing good habits. The blessed prophet's experience of Miraj can be seen as the culmination of so many individual good habits that he developed that led up to this point of transcendence in his life. When we read about the lives of various saints and Sufis through the ages, we see how the Salah was a transcendental experience for them. And while we may not know about the early parts of their lives, and we only hear or read about when their faith reached completion, common sense tells us that everyone probably faced the initial struggle to establish Salah. We can imagine a baby learning how to walk and standing and then falling and then standing and then falling and many times not even making it to standing, falling before taking a step and repeating the process over and over and over and then reaching the stage where they are walking. And so similarly, our Salah is to be established by following the example of that baby who never gives up, who gets up again and again and again. And then we reach that stage where joy can be found in our Salah, just like we find joy in other things in our lives. And if we don't pray, we feel restless, just as if we had missed out on having a cup of tea or coffee or dessert. In order to attain this level, we should exert ourselves to beautify our Salah. It is the root of all progress and the stairway, which is why it can be said and that the Blessed Prophet, that is why we remind ourselves of what the Blessed Prophet said, that Salah is the miraj of the believer. There have been thousands of righteous people in this Ummah and how did they attain their high station? It was through this regular habit of prayer and communion with Allah. The Blessed Prophet also said that the coolness of my eyes is in Salah and indeed when a person reaches that level, their prayer brings them untold joy. So I will end my brief khutbah by coming back to the question I mentioned in the beginning that Islam is a highly structured religion. Is the structure that Islam gives us a blessing for us or is it a burden? So after learning more about the beautiful vision of Miraj and its connection to Salah. And I will be forced to conclude that the structure of Islam is a huge blessing, which has the power to transform our lives. Because if we don't have this structure, which is urged upon us and we are given rewards for it and we are told that we shouldn't miss our Salah, the reason is to give us this opportunity and to not have the burden on us to come up with something. When am, I, when am I going to meditate? When am I going to do yoga? What time is the right time? When can I take a break? It is hard for us to come up with all of that by ourselves. But we are given that structure by Allah because Allah in his wisdom knows that life is confusing and chaotic and people need breaks. And so Salah gives us an opportunity to anchor the boat of our life so we are not randomly drifting around. May Allah help us to find the coolness of our eyes in our prayer and to treat it as a gift and not merely as an obligation. Amen. In the name of Allah, exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala ali muhammadin kama sallayta ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala muhammadin wa ala ali muhammadin kama barakta ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Servants of Allah. Allah commands justice, the doing of good, and liberality to kith and kin. And he forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion. He instructs you that you may remember. Remember Allah the supreme in glory, and he will remember you. 
and be thankful to him and he will increase you in bounty and seek his forgiveness. He will forgive you and have taqwa of him. He will make for you a way out of your issues. Jazakallah everybody for listening. That is the end.